The way that most people think of a muscle strain is when the muscle gets stretched beyond its normal range. A muscle comprises of what we call contractile elements, the bits that move in and out of each other in order to contract the muscle and relax the muscle. And these contractile elements are suspended in a framework of non-contractile tissue. In other words, like the tendons that are at each end and within the muscle that transmit the forces of the movement of the muscle so that the limb moves. The muscle contracts, the forces go via the tendon and the limb moves. When a stretch gets beyond the range, the normal range of, of the muscle, then obviously it's going to damage. Any material that you have, if you keep on stretching it, it gets to a limit and then tears. The muscles are exactly the same. Muscle strain classification is really there to help us with prognostication. In ordinary language, that means that it helps us to predict when a player may get back um, to playing and training. Um, none of these systems are foolproof, but they give us a guide. Um, and most of the modern ones are based on scan results. In other words, you look at the player, you look at the scan, and this gives you a good indication of when a player may get back to training and playing. The traditional way of grading muscle tears is, um, is based on a surgical model and was, was instigated before we had sophisticated scans like we do now. Grade one is, is disruption of between 0 and 5% of the muscle fibers. Grade two, between five and 95%, and grade three, between 95 and 100%. And you can see this is a, a relatively imperfect way of, of grading because most will fall into the grade two, but a 10% grade two and an 80% grade two aren't the same strain. So the more information we have, the better we can classify. So the symptoms of a muscle strain, in other words, what the player or athlete is feeling are pretty straightforward. A typical classical textbook history is where um, a player is running and feels something go, inverted commas, in, in their leg or, or their arm, and can't carry on. And the most important thing is, is, is to take that history. So if you're seeing a player in your clinic and you're not at pitch side, ask them what happened. What went on when they started feeling their pain? Pain is the most important symptom. Bleeding sometimes with bruising you often see. Um, and if there's a muscle rupture, in other words, the muscle has come apart in the middle, you often see either a gap, you can feel a gap, or you can see a bulge at one end, whereas the muscle contracts, it bunches up. The rest of the muscle doesn't bunch up at all because it's not connected anymore. So what are the causes of muscle strain? That you, the real thing is, is that there are lots of causes of muscle strains. Um, but I think the main ones that we always look for are not warming up properly. So the substitution that you see that when a player gets injured and suddenly a player has to come on, they're not warmed up properly. Lack of flexibility, in other words, if someone's very tight and their muscle we, we talked about a muscle stretching. If their muscle can't stretch, then they're going to be more prone to a muscle strain. Um, lack of strength is another cause of uh, muscle tear. If the muscle can't withstand some of the demands upon it, then yeah, it's going to give up the ghost and it will, it will break. Sprinting is obviously something that puts a lot of stress on muscles. And, and sprinting, certainly in football, is one of the reasons cited for the increase in in muscle injury. Sudden movement, one way or the other, um, whether you mean to or not, it, you're running and you cut one way, then you're more likely to injure yourself. But if someone comes up to you and pushes you or barges you, and the, it's an unintentional, uh, unintentional change of direction, then that's a reason that your muscle suddenly can't cope with the extra forces that it's put upon it. Kicking is another one, and we all understand that the front of the thighs, what we call the kicking muscle, often gets injured. Um, jumping, again, calf muscles can get injured during jumping. Um, and obviously trauma. So if you get just a blow to your muscle, um, yes, you end up looking at it and it looks like there may be a tear in it. But in fact, it's been, it's been traumatized 
and that's caused the defect in the muscle. In sport, you're always trying to look for reasons why things happen, because if you understand the reason why, then it may be that you can prevent things. And so we're always looking for risk factors. And the risk factors for muscle strain are multifactorial. And it's obvious that we haven't really got on top of what all the risk factors are, because if you look in football, the risk of a hamstring injury has gone up. It's not going down, despite everything that we do. Um, having a previous muscle injury is, predisposes you to a muscle injury, and probably because there's some weakness and still some lack of normal function within the muscle. Fatigue is an issue, and the pandemic has concertinaed the match schedule in all leagues worldwide in football, um, and there's been a, an increase in, in muscle injuries. We know that, we've seen it on the TV, and the guys that I speak to in professional football around the world all say the same thing. Um, sprinting or high energy activity, that can cause a muscle strain just because it, it the demands on the muscle are at, at its limit. Again, sudden change of direction, intentional or unintentional. And interestingly, having a concussion predisposes you to musculoskeletal injuries, obviously includes muscle for up to a year afterwards. Age is a factor and calf injury in the over 30s is much more common. Uh, and lastly, if someone has a lower limb muscle strain or muscle pain, you have to think about whether issues in the lumbar spine are involved. For instance, pressure on one of the nerves, causing the nerve to fire off in an abnormal way, give the wrong messages to the muscle, the muscle doesn't contract properly, and therefore uh, an injury uh, ensues. The diagnosis of a muscle strain is, is just like old school in a way, um, and this is a, a back to the, the first time you ever took a, a history from a patient in your uh, medical school or at physio school. Um, you take a history, you find out what happened. Um, was it sudden? Was it gradual onset? Um, and you examine the player fully after taking a history and then you have a tentative diagnosis. In sports medicine, imaging is such an important factor. We can't manage without experts, radiologists, we have some fantastic expert radiologists here at Aspatar. So athletes will get a scan of some kind, either ultrasound or uh, MRI, CT scan or plain X-ray, and we'll, we'll make a diagnosis together. So I, you'll find me with the radiologist asking them what they think about this all the time. I must get on their nerves because all I'm doing is asking them what they think. We work together um, and by doing that we get the best diagnosis and care plan for the athlete. Treatment of muscle strains is obviously a multidisciplinary exercise. After we've got a diagnosis, uh, the first port of call, as far as I'm concerned, is, is the physiotherapist. Physiotherapist and I work very closely together. We have fantastic physiotherapists here. Um, but the first thing to do is to make sure that we protect the part that's injured. Um, which means you ice it, you either, and you compress it, you elevate it, try and stop the bleeding, um, and you, you prescribe optimum loading. In ordinary language, that means if someone's got a muscle tear, say, in their calf and they can't walk properly, you give them a pair of crutches so they don't have to put strain on the, on the muscle that's injured. Um, I, I find then that reviewing the literature with the physiotherapist and the player and the coach means that we can come to a shared decision about what the next steps are. Um, this means that we look at what people have found, what the research says about what the return to play looks like, um, what the course of treatment should be, and how long it's gonna take. I'm always guided by the physiotherapist. They're the people that, that see the player go through each stage. Um, if they're worried about something, they'll ask me to review and I'll often review the player as they go through the system and get back to activity. Monitoring their progress, you can use GPS um, and you can make sure that by the time they get back to training that they're doing as much as they would have done in, in a training session before they got injured. And that information is usually available from their club or federation. <clears throat> and you feed back gradually into their availability to play. Um, you inform a coach and the player of, a, of the possible recurrence 
if the reintegration is too quick. Um, but this is a shared decision. This is a multidisciplinary team effort. Um, only by doing that will we will get the best out of the system that we can. Return to play is obviously a big issue in, in any sport and uh, you know, although I've been in football for a, a, involved in football for a long time, it doesn't care, I don't care what sport it is, return to play, return to perform is the most important issue for any athlete and certainly their coach and team and federation. So there are a couple of things about that. You want to avoid a recurrence and you want to avoid a new muscle strain. Um, so flexibility, strength, and rehabilitating uh, with a view, in a bespoke way, with a view to fitting them in to their team environment again, are the most important things to think about. Um, recovery after training or after any rehab um, session, including eating, drinking, rest, compress the area, cold baths maybe, um, are, are all very important. To try and avoid overreaching, again, during the rehab phase, when everyone's rushing to get back, very, very important. Again, this is a shared decision-making process. It's not me sitting making a decision. It's not the physio sitting making a decision. It's certainly not the coach or the player making the decision. They will have a different agenda, and it's our job in Aspatar to make sure that return to play is safe so that the athlete is fit to play, fit to perform. We love seeing athletes. I don't want to see any athletes because that means they're injured.